Well everyone, it's happening. We're coming up on the 20th anniversary of Peter Jackson's adaptation of J.R.R. Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings, which means it's the season for comprehensive retrospectives on all things Tolkien. Jackson's adaptation is an undeniable triumph, both a lushly realized, cohesive vision of the text and a masterpiece of savvy fandom marketing. Jackson made extremely effective use of the internet during production, curating an official fan club that lent the production a sense of authority and consensus. Whatever disagreement over adaptational decisions, the box set extended edition DVD still stand as a masterpiece of filmmaking and an undeniable set of bona fides. The display of a passion project wrought on a scale that comes along once in a lifetime, with dozens of hours of documentary combing over every minute detail of the process and effort that went into lovingly rendering the world. But before we all get swept away in that fervor like Nazgul in the river, I wanted to turn some attention towards Ralph Bakshi's 1978 adaptation. Now, I'm not setting out here to pit these adaptations against each other, but comparison is unavoidable. The Jackson trilogy looms large in culture, monolithic even. Not only is it the first version of the story an entire generation was exposed to, it has effectively mediated an agreed-upon interpretation of the text by virtue of its success as an adaptation, by virtue of looking and feeling right to the audience's eye, whatever that nebulous word means in this context. Bakshi's version is undeniably far more fraught. It is less cohesive, more reliant on an existing familiarity with the source material, frustratingly paced, and ultimately incomplete. It is often more accurate, more strictly faithful to the text, but just as often more hollow, with details that are true to the literal words on the page while missing the underlying point of those words. But it's not without its merits. Many of the adaptation decisions are interesting or excellent in their own right, presenting an interpretation of the text that is wildly different but just as compelling as Jackson. It is technologically decades ahead of itself, biting off far more than it can chew in pursuit of technological solutions that are now standard practice. This is a source of a lot of the film's inconsistency, but it's definitely a fascinating inconsistency. There is, all in all, a lot more to it than just being a weird early crack at a fantasy epic, and I think that's worth talking about. So let me tell you the story of a coked out pervert from Brooklyn and the movie that he so desperately wanted to make. First of all, The Lord of the Rings, the book, was not a runaway hit in the United States. While the component novels were published in the US within six months of their respective UK releases, the publisher, Houghton Mifflin, underestimated how popular the books would be. The Hobbit had been successful, but that was a children's book, released almost 20 years earlier. A lot had changed in America since 1937, and so the initial print run of Fellowship was only 1,500 copies. Now. If you only print 1,500 copies, it's hard to sell more than 1,500 copies. So even though that print run did sell out, it's not a clear indicator of the actual audience for the book and doesn't really give you a good idea of how many you should have printed. Consequently, it took years for sales to ramp up as Houghton Mifflin opted to trickle import copies from the UK instead of issuing new print runs. Somewhere in the early 1960s, this triggered a protectionist policy in US copyright law that, at the time, mandated a domestic manufacturing quota. Failing to meet the quota, The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings fell into the public domain in the United States where they sat until a law was passed in 1994 to restore the copyright to a number of similarly odd cases where otherwise still copyrighted foreign works had fallen into public domain in the US as a consequence of non-compliance with formalities like manufacturing requirements. But point is, even though sales of the book had picked up dramatically over the course of the 60s, particularly gaining traction with the counterculture crowd who identified with Tolkien's pastoral environmentalism, many of these publications, like the 150,000 copy Ace Books paperback printing in 1965, weren't licensed and paid no royalties back to Tolkien. 
This sparked a publicity battle over the issue, with Tolkien working with Ballantine Books to produce an authoritative, authorized paperback edition, but is also when the books finally surge in popularity, a decade after their initial publication. By the 1970s, the Tolkien estate was actively courting adaptations of J.R.R.'s work, since a licensed adaptation would actually pay royalties, and interest was finally there. In 1969, United Artists purchased the international film rights to Lord of the Rings directly from Tolkien, and they started trying to get a viable script and interested director. The idea of a film version of Lord of the Rings had already been floating around for years with various speculative projects dating back to the 50s, but while the counterculture crowd that had latched onto the books was increasingly proving to be a viable economic block, it was still not quite mainstream popular, which limited the possible budget of any project. United Artists didn't have much luck. Their attempts to get a full Lord of the Rings project rolling largely fell apart as the books developed a reputation of being unfilmable. Not because it was impossible, but because the budget would never be there to do justice to the book's many grand locations and fanciful sets. The story was simply too long to realistically compress into a single film, but setting out to make multiple films without assured success was folly, and surely audiences would revolt over an incomplete story. Any attempt at the time would be too compromised to satisfy the book's fans and too cheap looking to satisfy anyone else. Then along comes an animator named Ralph Bakshi. Born in Palestine but raised in Brooklyn, Ralph Bakshi is, you know, a bit of a character. Everyone else is behind. I'm not ahead. I'm doing what's right for an artist. He's doing what he believes in. It's about ahead of my times. What I am is honest. What they are is dishonest. He cut his teeth as an animator in the 1950s and 60s at Terry Toons at Paramount, working in television shows like Mighty Mouse, Deputy Dog, and Spider-Man before pivoting to feature films in the 1970s. The Lord of the Rings was Bakshi's fifth feature film as a director, and it is notable as both a culmination of his technical interests as an animator, utilizing mixed media as both a cost-saving and aesthetic tool, and the ways in which it deviates from Bakshi's normal narrative style. Bakshi was raised in the densely urban Brooklyn neighborhood of Brownsville, a historically poor neighborhood that, while originally dominated by Jewish factory workers, saw a heavy influx of black residents through the 40s, 50s, and 60s. This multiracial urban milieu forms the foundation of his early theatrical work. His first three films are all considered part of the urban street film genre, but before that, all right. To put this career into context, we need to back up to the 60s again. The 60s were not kind to theatrical animation in America. Owing to shifts in the way that movies were exhibited starting in the 50s, shorts became less financially viable, and so most of the money for animation shifted to the rapidly expanding market of television, which Hanna-Barbera and Warner Brothers dominated. Theatrical animation was largely the domain of Walt Disney, both the company and the man. Walt had been an absolutely titanic figure in the medium for decades, but on that front, things were not great. His health was declining, and the output of the studio dropped precipitously leading up to his death in 1966. While the studio had managed to put out a new animated feature approximately every 15 months on average over the course of the 40s and 50s, they only managed to complete three films in the 60s, 101 Dalmatians, The Sword in the Stone, and The Jungle Book, the animation studio relying mostly on reissues of their back catalog for the decade. While these films performed commercially well, The Jungle Book in particular being a huge hit, releasing in 1967 as Walt Disney's final film, they were not particularly challenging. These were interwoven with reissues of Bambi, Pinocchio, Cinderella, Snow White, Fantasia, and Peter Pan. And the follow-up, the first feature after Walt's death, is 1970's The Aristocats, which is just the absolute pinnacle of Disney's historical reputation for anodyne garbage. So this is what feature animation looks like if you're a 20-something in the 1970s. This is what you've grown up with. There's other stuff, of course, there's always something on the periphery, but overwhelmingly, the legacy of theatrical animation is safe, bright, unscary, trapped decades in the past, and slowly dying. In 1968, Ralph Bakshi, moving into his 30s and frustrated with the stagnant status quo of the industry, broke away and formed his own animation studio in Brooklyn. Initially, the studio found work on shows like Rocket Robin Hood and Spider-Man, but Bakshi had ambitions to move into feature films. 
He had a number of projects already in mind, including The Lord of the Rings, which he had fallen in love with after the books really broke out in the 60s. While he would spend years working on a half dozen projects in parallel, particularly trying to get in good graces with United Artists, who held the film rights for Lord of the Rings, the first film he was able to secure full funding for was an adaptation of comic artist Robert Crumb's underground hit, Fritz the Cat. Released in 1972 with an X rating, the film was perverted, juvenile, rambling, gratuitously violent, unfocused, aggressively political, and a huge success. Despite the rating limiting distribution options, the spectacle of a cartoon that was the opposite of all things Disney drew in a worldwide audience to the tune of $90 million against a budget of somewhere between $700,000 and $1.3 million. Following the success of Fritz the Cat, Bakshi was able to fund and distribute the animated quasi-autobiography pseudo-crime film Heavy Traffic, released in 1973. While not the astronomic success of Fritz, Heavy Traffic made decent money against its comparably slim budget and is considered a box office success. Both of these films did well with critics and remain artistically relevant. Personally, I think Heavy Traffic is the better of the two and certainly Bakshi's best film from the era, though it does encapsulate Bakshi's overall sensibilities as a creative. There is a fixation on black culture, the complicated racial identity of being Jewish in America, a deep and total distrust of police, disillusionment with the results of the counterculture movement, and a keen sense of the ways the structure of society is arranged to maintain an underclass. Artistically, there is a fascination with the idea of capturing reality. Photographs of real locations are used as trace references for backgrounds in Fritz, and many backgrounds in Heavy Traffic are just stylized photographs. Both films use some documentary recording for secondary dialogue, captured by Bakshi while walking around Harlem and Brooklyn, or interviewing people he met on the streets or in bars. Look, I'm paying my taxes. The money is what's happening. Hey, hey, See what I mean? No, See what I'm talking mean? about. It hey. all counts. Well, that is what's happening. I'm no, talking about as far as, like, if you want to be revolutionary, you get some bread first, and then you can talk trash. Why do you blind us with religion? There's also a pervasive horniness, as it's rare to go an entire scene with a woman without a breast popping out for no reason, the slapstick humor of Terry Toons is often extended into bloody hyperviolence, and there is a complicated relationship with queer characters. While Bakshi's eye as a director is certainly sympathetic to drag queens, trans women, and gay men, they clearly form an integral part of the real spaces and communities that he is trying to simulate in his art. Narratively, they tend to be present just long enough to be physically brutalized as a condemnation of police and bigots. While these two films demonstrated that adult-oriented animation could be financially and critically successful, not much really changed in the wider perception of animation. These films were still essentially novelties. While there was some attempt by others to capitalize on the success of Bakshi's films in America, this mostly took the form of distributors quickly repackaging English dubs of adult animation from Japan and Europe. Bakshi would follow this up with his most controversial film, Coonskin, an adaptation of the Uncle Ramus stories, transplanting them from the rural American self into a gangster story in Harlem. While this movie occupies something of a place alongside contemporary black exploitation films like Sweet Sweetback's Badass Song, Dolomite, and Shaft, and has been praised for the depth of the references in its adaptation, such as including details from the African myths that predate Uncle Ramus, it also heavily utilizes historical racist caricature and minstrel imagery. There's a lot of debate about the artistic intent behind the film, whether or not the use of this imagery is intended to shock and shame the white institutions that created the imagery in the first place, how effective it is at that, and whether or not protests of the film in 1975 were justified. But reflecting on it 45 years later, the main thing that stands out to me is a sort of fixation at play. Like Bakshi just wanted to also make a black exploitation film, a genre that sprang out of the kinds of neighborhoods that he grew up in and out of a community that he saw himself as a part of. And reception was far from universal. The Congress of Racial Equality protested it, the NAACP supported it as a difficult satire, and according to Bakshi, the Wu-Tang Clan love it. It's a very complicated intersection of politics and influences that ultimately hinge on the question of whether or not this was Bakshi's story to tell. 
Modern commentators have compared it favorably to Childish Gambino's This Is America. And I guess at the end of the day, the meat of the film is that the cops and the mafia suck. <laughs> Coonskin was not successful and did slow the momentum on Bakshi's career, but it was still a relatively inexpensive film and the failure was not a fatal blow to his career as a director. During post-production on Coonskin, Bakshi came up with the concept for Hey Good Looking, another street film, this time set in the 50s, but one in which animated and live-action characters would interact. Warner Brothers agreed to finance the film in 1973, and the live-action footage was shot largely improvisationally in early 74. However, the film would never be completed as originally conceived, as the process of having live action and animated characters interact proved to be too labor-intensive to complete on the film's budget of $1.5 million. A rotoscoping rig was built at Bakshi's Brooklyn studio to try and speed up the animation process, but a series of conflicts between Bakshi and Warner Brothers led to the film's release date being pushed back several times before being shelved indefinitely. While Hey Good Looking was trapped in post-production hell, Bakshi would release his first family-friendly feature, Wizards, which is also a departure from his urban life-focused films into an explicit genre film. Family-friendly is a bit of a weird misnomer here though, as the film is still deliberately aimed at adults rather than an all-ages crowd, but it's also a lot tamer, with less sex, gore, and profanity. The film was moderately successful, enough to keep it from being considered a flop, which is somewhat impressive given that the movie is quite bad. Aside from some notable iconography and some compelling backgrounds, the flow of the film suffers from all the disjointed scene composition of Bakshi's early films. While that works for Heavy Traffic, a film about powerless characters trying to find their way in a disjointed world, it really works against a film that is so plot-heavy, there's an entire movie's worth of story dumped on the audience in the prologue. Illuminating history bearing on the everlasting struggle for world supremacy. The first blast was set off by five terrorists. It was a big day in Montagar. Delia felt a pull from the sky. The older fairy instantly knew that these were not ordinary twins. The day will come, my brother, when I will return and make this a planet where mutants rule. Politically, the film is bizarre. It is clearly working through a lot of opinions about the anti-war movement. The protagonists are mostly twee fairies from a literal fantasy land of mushrooms and rainbows who are mowed down by machine gun wielding mutants hopped up on Nazi propaganda until the bearded wizard ends the war by shooting skeleton Hitler. But those opinions haven't been worked enough to make them coherent or interesting, and the end result flips rapidly between unbearably treacle and deeply cynical. It's not cohesive in style, the characters look like they're from completely different films, it's horny in a way that's leering and uncomfortable rather than sexy, and it's pretty boring. The most notable elements of the film are all historical trivia. The film was being financed by Fox, and Bakshi found himself in budget meetings with George Lucas, who was working on Star Wars at the time, and the two became professional acquaintances. George asked Ralph to change the working title of War Wizards to avoid conflict with Star Wars, and Ralph agreed because George let Mark Hamill take time off from Star Wars to record a part in Wizards. I'm Sean, leader of the Knights of Stardust, protectors of Dolan. King of the Mountain Fairies. It's also the first film where Bakshi really experimented with mixing in stylized live action footage, utilizing various rotoscoping and Xerox techniques to save budget on animating large battle scenes. The film was moderately successful, but Ralph's goodwill towards George Lucas came to an end when Star Wars, released three weeks after Wizards, largely replaced it in theaters. Parallel to the production of most of these films, Bakshi pesters United Artists, who have been stalling out on all of their attempts at getting a Lord of the Rings film rolling. Bakshi says he pitched UA on an animated Lord of the Rings in 72 and 73, but they didn't bite. Then in 75, he convinces Mike Metavoy to give him a chance, and Metavoy agrees loosely to two or three films plus something Hobbit-related. Problem was, United Artists already had a script written in 1970 by then-TV writer John Borman, who at this point in 1975 had just written and directed Zardoz. The gun is good. There was some conflict over the script because... <coughs> well, 
It is absolutely buck wild. There is a Galadriel Frodo sex scene, Aragorn and Boromir kiss passionately with Arwen's blood on their lips, the history of the ring is presented as a rock opera at the Council of Elrond, and Gimli is rebirthed in mud to recall the ancient ancestral password to Moria. Bakshi convinced Dan Melnick at MGM to buy out the project so that they could throw the script out and start over, which they do. So Bakshi starts over on the script with novice screenwriter Chris Conkling, but when Dan Melnick gets ousted from MGM in 1976, the new producer, Dick Shepard, doesn't seem to know or care about the project at all, so Bakshi gets in touch with Saul Zantz, who had helped him finance Fritz back in 71, and convinces him to buy out the project from MGM, thus landing the thing back at United Artists. Incidentally, Zance goes beyond this, buying out the entirety of Tolkien's film, stage, and merchandising rights, which starts a chain reaction that would eventually lead, decades later, to the troubled production that resulted in The Hobbit Battle of Five Armies. Why does it hurt so much? Unsatisfied with Conkling's work, Bakshi and Zance sideline him and hire Peter S. Beagle, author of The Last Unicorn, to do a rewrite, which Bakshi and Zance are mostly happy with, and finally, in 1976, a theatrical Lord of the Rings film is full steam ahead. Before the movie even hits theaters, though, it has two complications. The first is obviously Bakshi's reputation and style. Is Gandalf going to whip his dick out and piss off the bridge of Khazad Doom? Will Pipeweed be some dank bud? Who knows? The second is Rankin Bass, an American production company that mostly made seasonal television specials by outsourcing animation to Japan. Rankin Bass had been working on an adaptation of The Hobbit as a TV special since 72, and it was looking to broadcast by 77. Additionally, they had already storyboarded a sequel to their Hobbit film utilizing large chunks of The Return of the King. Both of these would conflict with any Lord of the Rings film United Artists produced, particularly once Bakshi convinced them the film could be done justice if it were animated, since audiences would assume they were all related. But since the books were still public domain, Rankin Bass could do whatever they wanted, at least within the US, and a lawsuit to intervene succeeded only in securing a broadcast agreement in Canada. Mm, my precious, will it taste delicious? Bakshi's production, even after settling down at United Artists, was tumultuous, but mostly in a way that's probably better described as indecisive. The script was overhauled several times, mostly because of arguments about how much of the books should or could be adapted into a single movie. Bakshi and Beagle ultimately pushed for two movies, the first encompassing Fellowship and Two Towers, and intended for this film to be subtitled Part 1, but United Artists waffled on committing to a second film. They didn't outright say no in a way that would have pushed the production to commit everything to one film or make it more conclusive, but they also left the fate of part two in the hazy realm of, well, let's wait and see what happens. Of course, as history has already borne out, the sequel was never produced and the film ends up with a disorientingly quick resolution where Gandalf implies that the Battle of Helm's Deep is in fact the deciding moment of victory, end of story. Released in 1978, reaction was lukewarm but broadly positive and not terribly harsh. Most of Bakshi's idiosyncrasies as a director are either absent or under control. Sort of. It's certainly the least juvenile, no one whips their dick out, everyone's tits stay inside their shirts, there's no random comedy skits inserted haphazardly to pad runtime, and the adaptation is certainly faithful in the sense that the vast majority of the dialogue is copied directly from the books. But, and this is probably its biggest flaw, it still exhibits Bakshi's inability to focus on the story at hand. Jackson's films, especially Fellowship, are an illustrative comparison here. Jackson's films are focused and cohesive. It's an adventure story about big events and big emotions, the unbreakable bond of friendship forged in adversity, the pain of loss, and the swelling moments of triumph. You bow to no one. Jackson gets how the characters and plot interweave, that it's explicitly a story about how this big adventure changes the characters, and if you don't have both, then you don't have the whole. So here's the problem. Bakshi just isn't very good at plot or pacing. 
He learned his craft working on slapstick cartoons, and his first three films are effectively just a series of vignettes. Heavy Traffic is an urban slice-of-life film, and Fritz the Cat and Coonskin are both adapted from explicitly episodic material. This is not strictly a criticism. It works in Heavy Traffic. It's not a bad style. There's nothing wrong with vignette storytelling. It just needs the right material. But then you get Wizards, which is supposed to be this really plot-driven adventure story, heavy on world-building, and it's just a meandering mess. Unimportant skits drag on for minutes, action scenes repeat stock battle clips endlessly, and important moments resolve in seconds. While less extreme than Wizards, this is unfortunately the main failing of Lord of the Rings. Back she was, for most of the 70s, both extremely busy, juggling multiple productions simultaneously, and also, allegedly, on a lot of drugs. It's just not a state of mind that's really conducive to making a film that maintains a tight focus for two and a half hours, and it shows. The film has a lot of content to try and fit into its runtime, and yet the flight at the Ford is an interminably long prog rock jam session of Frodo falling off a horse. The story is presented very literally, lifted straight from the novels, but with little weight for how it all connects together. This creates a notable problem when the film transitions from Fellowship into Two Towers, because the adaptation is so faithful to the books that it feels like you're at the end of the movie, but it just keeps going. Also, the second half of the film is pretty weak in general. The sequences get really muddled, a lot of threads are dropped, presumably to have been picked up in part two, and there are more and more animation shortcuts taken as the production ran up against budget constraints. On one hand, the sheer volume of Roto done on the Battle of Helm's Deep is already immense, but on the other hand, there's a lot of shots like this where you can just outright see that it's a guy wearing rubber orc gloves. While otherwise the backgrounds in the film range from gorgeously stylized paintings to evocative abstract non-landscapes, for most of the Battle of Helm's Deep, any background or distance is filled with stock footage of clouds, regardless of camera angle. On top of the shortcuts, Bakshi is just generally not very good at keeping track of the action and geography of the fight scenes, making them really hard to follow, and the muddy, high-contrast artwork doesn't help. Then at the end, Gandalf rides in, and the narrator implies that this battle defeated Sauron, but also maybe stay tuned for part two? The forces of darkness were driven forever from the face of Middle-earth by the valiant friends of Frodo. As their gallant battle ended, so too ends the first great tale of The Lord of the Rings. It's not a strong ending. The film mixes animation styles in a way that reads like Bakshi was constantly experimenting on the fly, and how a scene ends up looking is dictated by what seemed like a cool idea that week. And while this mixed media style is interesting in its own way, the inconsistency of it contributes to a sense that there wasn't a committed idea everyone was working towards, that the ultimate creative vision was driven mostly by momentary fascinations. For The Lord of the Rings, Bakshi utilized a hodgepodge of animation formats predominantly based on rotoscoping, modifying live-action footage to various degrees. Some of this involves using the live-action footage as a trace reference, the final product being a complete replacement. Sometimes it's a paint-over, effectively just augmenting the original footage with details like eyes or fangs, and sometimes it's effectively just a colorization of a Xerox of the original footage. And no, that's not being snide. An actual process that was in use in the 60s, 70s, and 80s involved photocopying line work done on paper onto cellophane, allowing rougher pencil lines to be used without inking. An earlier version of this technique is what gives 101 Dalmatians its distinctly ragged look. If used on a photograph, however, it crushes most of the grayscale tones, flattening the image to solid blacks and whites. The second major technique used is solarization, which was recommended to him by the film cinematographer Timothy Galfess. Solarization, more accurately pseudo-solarization, is a tricky process where the black and white film is partially developed, then instead of being sent through a process called fixing, the part of the development that stabilizes the film so it can be handled, the image is re-exposed to light and sent through the entire development process a second time. 
This technique applied to photochemical film is extremely difficult to control, largely relying on trial and error to get desirable results, but the successful end product is a partially inverted image, with common artifact being a strong border across high contrast boundaries, which can look kind of like an inked outline. Bakshi felt this stylization process was sufficiently animation-like that it would fit within the movie and allow them to use footage of large-scale battles, which were ultimately faster and cheaper to stage with actors in costumes than to hand-draw frame by frame, even from a reference. All of these different techniques are combined to various degrees over the course of the movie. Sometimes solarized footage is painted over, sometimes it's merely colorized, sometimes it's just played as is over a colored background. The extensive amount of rotoscoping and repurposed footage ultimately required the production to shoot basically the entire film as live action first, with reference performers, stunt performers, and the extensive battle scenes. So the two-year production involved essentially making the entire movie twice, first in the live-action shoot in Madrid, and second in the animation. There's a somewhat apocryphal story in all of this. In shooting the footage, they didn't really bother to clear backgrounds of things like telephone wires, cars, airplanes, bicycles, and other obviously out-of-place elements because it didn't really matter. It wasn't the finished film anyway. According to Bakshi, the Spanish developers who were handling the camera negatives didn't understand that the footage was a reference that would be animated on top of, thought that this was instead incredibly sloppy filmmaking, feared that it would give Madrid a bad name, and attempted to destroy the film. I'm repeating the story because it's kinda cute, but it's also a bit too weird and sensational, and the only source is Bakshi himself, who is, let's just say, prone to exaggeration. Like, he'll say they had 600 animators working on Lord of the Rings, when in reality it was more like 50. I was over in Spain shooting major live action footage. I had 3,000 people in the studio back in New York animating. I'm fielding 500 calls a day from the problems in the studio. I'm shooting an entire live action movie, and I'm trying to eat dinner with Zents at night who wants to be talked to. Or this bit from a 2006 interview with Underground Online. I had the X rating on my films, and that should have been enough to protect me. It was all a misunderstanding of me being too far ahead of the curve. Now they do as much on The Simpsons as I got an X rating for Fritz the Cat. And like, no? No, Ralph? No, they don't. No, they don't. What do you think happens on The Simpsons? I am very curious what Ralph Bakshi thinks happens on The Simpsons. On the whole, the film is a mixed bag. There's a lot of jank, but what works? What does it get right? A lot, actually. Woo, Sam Ganji. Your legs are too short, so use your head. The vocal performances in particular are generally good, often great. The voice actors do well with Tolkien's words, with an interpretation that is both distinct and appropriate. One thing that's often cited as a standout, though, is John Hurt's performance as Aragorn, and for good reason. It's fantastic. It matters. We still have a long road and much to do. Why? We've no hope without Gandalf. You know that, Aragorn. Then we must do without hope. There is always vengeance. Gruff yet warm, there's a lot to love about this performance. John Hurt was a great actor, and he absolutely has a world-weary charisma that really works here. It's fantastic. I love it. And it meshes well with Bakshi's naturalistic filmmaking sensibilities. This version of the characters that are not so much the protagonists of a fantasy epic, but just some dudes trying to solve a problem. We have no choice, Aragorn. We might go by way of the Gap of Rohan. That would take the ring too close to Isengard and Aruman. We dare not risk it. Yet you would risk the minds of Moria. While Bakshi is bad at pacing and action, he's got a good sense for the interplay between characters, and the film's best moments come in snippets from these interactions. The dynamics of conflict in dialogue, and the small, physical actions that punctuate those moments. Scenes like Boromir's death hold sufficient dramatic weight. The reference acting, animation, and vocal performances all come together and really work in a way that shows off the film at its strongest. Just the clink and clank of equipment, the subtle atmospheric wind, and a mature tenderness as the three pay respects to a fallen comrade. And there's little moments, just great touches of detail, like Sam and Frodo paddling in opposite directions as they debate the next course of action, where the rhythm of it is spot on. A fantastic little flair that communicates the emotion that underlies the dialogue. 
It's a keen physical detail that a lazier production would miss. The twitchy, feral movements of the Black Riders is a weird creative decision, but I think it works. It's unsettling and menacing in an unusual way, though it does get a little odd when the Nazgul simply stop behaving like this after the Prancing Pony. Again, consistency is a problem. There's also small adaptational decisions. Lord of the Rings is so big and sprawling that basically any cinematic adaptation will have to pick and choose what it includes and what it doesn't. For as comprehensive as the Jackson films are, there's a lot they had to leave behind. Like this little moment after Gandalf opens the door to Moria. So all you had to do was say, friend, and then turn. Those were happier times. It's a great little touch to include because the whole joke of the door to Moria for the reader is that they're overthinking the problem, that the troubles facing the Fellowship, the rise of Sauron in the East, has created a culture of fear, a culture of security and paranoia that leads Gandalf to assume the answer is more complicated than it really is. It's a melancholic point about how the people of Middle-earth have grown apart, distrustful and isolated, to the point that even being asked to say friend feels like a trick. It's a good detail to include. Bakshi's film is basically the only adaptation to include Frodo's defiance of the ring wraiths at the ford. By all the Shire, you shall have neither the ring nor me! I also really like the introduction, presented as a shadow play. It's cheap and poorly acted and looks like community theater, but that's what I find endearing about it. Like, it could just as well be an in-universe performance of myth. You've got actors who are clearly trying to avoid hurting each other with their prop swords and are miming slow motion instead of actually shooting the footage in slow motion, and it's clearly taking place on a stage, but the fact that it's so evidently low budget, I don't know, I find it charming. Now, unfortunately for all the things that I do enjoy about this movie, all the things that I think work or are at least admirable for their ambition, there's a lot that doesn't, either failing entirely or just not quite coming together into a cohesive whole. Like, for example, the Balrog. Alright, so a bit of a sidetrack with the Balrog here. One of the biggest running arguments in Tolkien scholarship is this. Does the Balrog actually have wings, or does it merely have a form that is evocative of wings? Or does it have neither wings nor a form evocative of wings, but an incorporeal aura of darkness that projects the impression of wings without being a component part of the substance or form of the Balrog's essential self? Relevant passages from the book are in The Fellowship of the Ring, where first Tolkien writes about the Balrog, the shadow about it reached out like two vast wings, and a couple paragraphs later, it stepped forward onto the bridge and suddenly it drew itself up to a great height and its wings were spread from wall to wall. This apparent conflict between a stylistic description and a literal description has formed the foundation of a half-century-long debate over the intended physical properties of a mythological demon. As of June 2021, the Tolkien Society fact still has as the top entry, Do Balrogs Have Wings? Can They Fly? Which they summarize with, That's up to each individual reader to decide. Quora, the spiritual successor to Yahoo Answers, has multiple threads on the subject. Bakshi, perhaps unknowingly, stepped right in this when he gave the Balrog big ol' bat wings with a Balrog that's definitely reminiscent of the Hildebrandt Brothers Balrog from the 1977 Tolkien art calendar. The 1987 calendar featured a wingless Balrog painted by Tolkien scholar Ted Naismith. John Howe's 1996 painting Gandalf Falls with a Balrog features a distinctly bat-winged demon. Peter Jackson threaded the needle with a Balrog that is as much a smoke monster as it is physical, though it still definitely has wings. Video games also alternate between wings and no wings. Tolkien hack David Day's A Tolkien Bestiary indicates no wings, while Robert Foster's authoritative The Complete Guide to Middle Earth is mum on the subject. The online Encyclopedia of Arda, dating back to 1997, spends four-fifths of its word count for the entry on Balrog summarizing both the pro and anti-wing arguments, though ultimately errs on the side of no wings without taking a definitive stance. The start of this argument naturally just spurs further arguments. The Balrog were created with intent by Melkor, therefore 
Vestigial wings would be illogical, and if the Balrog had wings, then surely it wouldn't just plummet when the bridge collapses, which leads to arguments about the nature of wings themselves, since after all, even if it has wings, it's not a helicopter or a hummingbird and probably couldn't just hover. Penguins, chickens, and emu all have wings, but they would plummet. Even flighted birds like condor and albatross can't just take off from a standstill. But this argument also neglects to consider that both Melkor and the Balrog were created with intent by one honorable Mr. Sir Jolkin Rolkin Rolkin Tolkien, and wings are both rad and badass, functional or not. And anyway, if Balrog have wings, why couldn't they just fly the ring into Mordor? Now, the wings are not something that particularly bothers me. The Hildebrandt painting is actually my earliest memory of Tolkien, period, as it's the cover of the book Art of the Brothers Hildebrandt, and we had a copy kicking around the house when I was a kid. So this is already a formative vision of the scene for me. Clearly, the actual fact of wings is secondary to the narrative functionality of the evocative image of Gandalf as a point of light standing off against an enveloping darkness. The actual problems with the Balrog here in Bakshi's version aren't wings in and of themselves, but that the design just doesn't come together and, most importantly, is really poorly animated. Now, Bakshi as an animator is not particularly good at momentum. Motion and momentum are core elements of animation, and it's something that Bakshi has always struggled with. Part of his experimentation with rotoscoping was tied to this. It's a cost-saving measure, but also it means that the momentum problem solves itself. You have real footage to work from. The momentum is already real. It's done for you. Boom. Of course, animated momentum and real momentum aren't the same thing, and your rotoscope is only going to look as good as your source footage, which is going to be really hard to get right if you don't have a 12-foot tall Balrog to shoot some reference footage of. This is a moment where the realism of rotoscoping is absolutely undermining the final product, because we are, unfortunately, seeing through to the underlying reality of a man in a costume trying to mime being really big by just moving slowly. It's not dynamic, it's not threatening, and it comes off as unfortunately goofy. This is a running thing through the film. Most of the action scenes lack a sense of weight to their movement. The actors are just lightly swinging their prop swords at each other, pulling their punches, because, you know, it's just a reference. But since the reference is being traced frame by frame, that performance carries through to the final animation. Sometimes the rotoscope inherits a really effective sense of weight, and sometimes it ends up looking cheap and fake. This also leaves behind a number of strange artifacts in how shots are framed. They're few and far between, but there's the occasional shot where the framing is oddly tight, where characters drift out of frame in a way that's highly unusual for animation, where the positioning of characters is normally extremely deliberate. The pitfall of a rotoscoped film is that the final results depend heavily on your references. The reference performers aren't simply providing something to help the animators get the right idea. Their performance is the performance, and there's a definite inconsistency here. And that's really the word of the day, isn't it? The biggest failings of Bakshi's Lord of the Rings are matters of inconsistency. Sometimes the reference actors are giving it their all, and sometimes they're just loosely miming the actions. Sometimes footage is shot in slow motion, and other times the actors just swing their swords slowly. Scenes change style and grain and texture on the fly, and characters are animated in multiple different styles across the film as a whole. Heck, sometimes characters switch techniques multiple times within the span of a few seconds, as with Aragorn running down this hallway. There's also a thing that happens a few times where the scenes were too complicated to fully animate, like Merry and Pippin fighting the orcs before their capture, but the underlying footage is in really bad shape. Super high contrast, super underexposed, super grainy, and the whole image just turns into an indecipherable blob. A much commented on quirk of the movie is that a lot of the characters wave their hands around really aimlessly. This is going to come down to a direction issue, as it's a very community theater kind of quirk of acting with untrained actors overusing their hands. The Nazgul and orcs being mostly paint over work, with much of the actual costume still visible, works but is undercut by the fact that the Fellowship two are often animated as paintovers, with their live-action counterparts being extremely visible. Even the full replacement traceovers aren't without their own oddities, as the style is so chaotic, with line work that squiggles a lot between frames, 
that it's extremely intrusive when characters stop moving entirely, becoming unnaturally still for a few frames between actions. That's a limitation of budget, yes, and I don't begrudge the animators for saving those frames, but the style very much accentuates the effect and calls attention to it. Treebeard is pretty much the only character in the film that's entirely animated from scratch, which places him out of place at the other extreme end of the spectrum, being very fluid and morphy, traditionally cartoonish, looking more like an outcast from an Atkinson production like the raccoons than the comparably heavy animation of the rest of the film. And while that heavier animation generally looks really neat, the increased fidelity will, again, work against the film, as any time the lip sync is off, it feels really off. When out, I to start. There's also an issue with the dialogue that, well, descriptively the dialogue in a lot of places is stilted, and the recording is thin. The micro-pacing of dialogue that makes it feel natural, that makes it flow, it's not always there, and a lot of unspoken vocalizations are missing, which can make conversations drag and feel unnatural. I'll give it to you, Gandalf. You're wise and powerful. What will you not? No! Do not tempt me. This is a result of the production process. There's two factors here. For... I guess budgetary reasons, they apparently didn't have a multi-track recorder, and also the voice actors are ultimately having their performance superimposed on the performance of the live-action actors, which is substantially different from other methods of animation, where either the animators work from the actor's performance, or the actor matches the performance created by the animators. And so while the production opted to do the recording sessions with the cast as a group, according to Anthony Daniels, the actors were required to leave a long two-second pause between each other's lines so that the editors could try and line the two performances up. I mean, I can see the logic there. Like, you assume you've got this process that affords you a lot of freedom. You don't need to wait for one part to be done so that the other half can match it. You can just do both halves whenever it's convenient, and then merge them later. But, you know, it's the details that get lost in that process. On the whole, the film's pacing is just really off. Some sequences, like the flight to the Ford mentioned before, go on at seemingly an interminable length, while the entire second half of the film is incredibly rushed. Even one-off moments will end up bizarrely truncated, like the smoke trailing out of Moria behind the Fellowship, which flashes on screen so briefly I wasn't sure if I had bumped the remote and skipped a scene. Mary and Pippin vanish from the film entirely after meeting Treebeard, a casualty of the unproduced sequel, but regardless of the intent, their exit is undeniably sudden. Likewise, Sam and Frodo meet Gollum, set off towards the Dead Marches, and are never seen or mentioned again. One particular oddity is that Saruman is alternately called either Saruman or Aruman. I must go south now to consult with the wizard Aruman. I have come for your aid, Saruman the White, in troubled times. This bizarre inconsistency is a result of Saul Zant's insistence that the names of the antagonists, Sauron and Saruman, sounded to alike, which I mean, is fair enough as an adaptation change, but then during fairly routine rewrites mid-production, Beagle began swapping the names back to Saruman. A Saruman of many colors! If there is something you can say is missing from Bakshi's Middle Earth, it would be Middle Earth itself. This is perhaps where the comparison between Bakshi and Jackson is the starkest. While much of this is an argument of adaptational preference, which lines and details were included, which phrases and character traits were stressed, one area where the older film is undeniably weaker is in the presence of the world, and this is a meaningful absence. Place is critical to the story of Lord of the Rings because Lord of the Rings is as much a story about violence against the land itself as it is about violence against the people who live on it. And while Bakshi's artists are able to visualize many iconic locations, both the fantastic and the quaint, just as often the background dissolves away into abstraction, into nowhere in particular. Though there is an isolated artistry to these compositions as a storytelling mechanism, as an expression of the text, they just don't compete with Jackson's camera turned towards the beauty of New Zealand. This gaze, importantly, retains the essence of the message. 
the world is good, the world is beautiful, the world is worth saving, and not just the so-called important parts. Tolkien's notoriously florid descriptions are just as reverent of grassland and marsh as they are of forest and mountain. This is the biggest misstep of the old adaptation, the vision of Middle-earth not just as a land under assault from a malevolent spirit seeking power, but a land besieged by the smog and consumption and poisonous runoff of industry. Ultimately, the biggest flaw of the film is that it's kind of boring. Not uninteresting, but all these issues add up to long stretches of the film that just aren't particularly noteworthy. There is, at least in my opinion, very little after the death of Boromir that's really worth it, and given that his funeral is 85 minutes into the movie, not only is it a clear demarcation point between two parts of the story, it's already a decent feature length. So, if you kinda check out there, I don't really blame you. There's also a deeper issue that kind of cuts two ways, and it's that the film relies a lot on understanding the source material. Now, I don't think this is a conscious reliance. I do think that Bakshi and Conkling and Beagle tried to create a telling of the story that's self-contained, but there's enough holes, enough things that are breezed past, that there's definitely the sense that things are missing. The keen awareness that this is an abridgment of a much larger book, and so bits are included for the sake of being comprehensive, rather than because they make the best version of the story for the medium. I said this cuts two ways, and that's because while this can make for an unsatisfying viewing on its own, it can also potentially make for a satisfying companion to the novel, where the viewer's own knowledge of the text is able to fill the gaps and their imagination is able to do the heavy lifting of fleshing it all out, using the movie as an aid to their own internal visualization and realization of the story. Part of the trouble in researching the film is that based on Bakshi's own recollections of the film, it's not even entirely clear when they decided to animate the film, or if the whole film was meant to be conventionally animated with only a bit of rotoscoping, but then they decided to rotoscope nearly the entire thing, or if at one point they were even considering cutting the animation entirely and just making a live-action film. These were, apparently, decisions that were made more or less on the fly in 1976, a reflection of the problems plaguing the still unfinished Hey Good Lookin'. I don't want to say that this is a film made by filmmakers who didn't care, who didn't get the source material. It is a film that's lovingly made. It is a film that's made by creatives who cared. The script is clearly intimately familiar with the source material, but it also seems like a film that was made by creatives who were very distracted, who didn't have a strong vision and were focused principally on working quickly and making whatever compromises were needed just to get things done. And to be clear, that's not a moral failing. It's not a sin to be more concerned with getting the film done, getting it in front of audiences, than picking fights with the studio. They turned around a two and a half hour animated film in two years. That's insane. It's amazing that the whole thing didn't entirely self-destruct, that the final result is not only reasonably watchable, but often interesting and occasionally brilliant. That's impressive. So the movie comes out with the title The Lord of the Rings. No part, one subtitle. United Artists felt that no one would want to pay to see half a story. Of course, that seems ridiculous today, what with film being so thoroughly dominated by serial franchises, but in 1978 the concern was still sensible. The two-part film didn't really exist yet, and even franchises were sparse and more along the lines of James Bond, a loosely connected episodic rather than a single cohesive story with meaningful continuity. But still, a to-be-continued would not have seriously shocked audiences. Well, Bakshi had done some press where he was able to talk about how they'll hopefully get to make the rest of the story with part two, the media landscape was entirely different in 1978. There isn't a massive ecosystem of entertainment news, there's no widespread internet, there's no fan blogs hanging off every detail of production, so the general audience impression going in is that this is the whole thing. Fans of the book are, of course, caught off guard by the ending, the story just stopping after the Battle of Helm's Deep, and they're not super happy about that, but on the whole, audiences are pretty receptive and the film does well. 
Critics are lukewarm, but consensus is ultimately positive. Roger Ebert's bottom line summary is, I think, right on the money. Quote, In sum, Bakshi has succeeded better at bringing Tolkien's characters to life than at bringing his story to fruition. And that's kinda where things have stayed. Critical reevaluation hasn't really changed over the decades since. It's flawed, mostly boring, but not entirely devoid of charm. It's quieter and stiffer than Jackson's high-intensity action-adventure, but that's not wholly inappropriate, as Tolkien's books are themselves so very often quiet and stiff. The film was successful, it turned a reasonable profit, but it wasn't a runaway success. Bakshi was feeling burnt out on working on someone else's story, and leadership changes at United Artists in 1978 proved to be enough of an interruption to the momentum of the project that attempts to get Part 2 moving just fizzled out. Bakshi would continue to use rotoscoped animation for three of his next four films, though audience interest waned as the style grew increasingly dated compared to the lush and intricate animation of its big-budget contemporaries, and as Bakshi seemingly ran out of energy and ideas. Hey Good Lookin' was eventually released in 1982 in a totally overhauled format, the film having been essentially remade as a totally animated feature over the course of seven years, financed by Bakshi himself, though little of the rotoscoping remained. It is, for the most part, just a worse version of Heavy Traffic, lacking the incendiary politics and righteous anger that gives that film its bite. I don't know, maybe it was just Bakshi getting older, maybe you just couldn't sell an anti-cop movie in Reagan's America. He eventually retired from feature films after the flop of Cool World in 1992, a film that was, ironically, not nearly as crass as audiences had hoped. But as a pure quirk of coincidence, the animated legacy of The Lord of the Rings isn't entirely incomplete, because Rankin Bass, leveraging the public domain status of the books, aired the sequel to their Hobbit adaptation in 1980, and it just so happens to more or less pick up shortly after Bakshi's film ends. The specifics here are disputed since the Rankin Bass Return of the King had been storyboarded years earlier, but it also didn't really start serious production until 78. So while the film wasn't intended to capitalize on the cancellation of Bakshi's second film, it still did? Mostly bad in an annoying way and very cheaply made, this TV movie is largely unmemorable save for the absolute banger where there's a whip, there's a way. Where there's a whip. There's a way. Of course, then, a little over 20 years later, Peter Jackson, that guy who makes perverted puppet movies, would finally get to make a no-holds-barred adaptation of The Lord of the Rings, and it's really good. Come on, Mr. Frodo. I can't carry it for you. But I can carry you! Ultimately, the legacy of Bakshi's film is in technology. Techniques that were odd and unique are today routine. He didn't invent any of them, strictly speaking. The underpinning technology was already decades old, but the haphazard, experimental, ambitious way that they're applied, the mix of success and failure, is ahead of its time, presaging the ways that filmmaking was changing and would continue to change. This isn't to say that Bakshi and his animators changed the arc of history, but rather they saw what was inevitable about the way that these technologies would be applied and bit off far more than they could chew decades before the tech was actually ready. Bakshi understood that the greatest limitation of realizing the world of Tolkien was the world itself, and he solved this problem by cutting out photographs of actors, maybe painting on them a little and placing them into animated environments. And that right there describes basically every Marvel movie. For 20 years now, it's been routine for actors to work against worlds that they can't see, that are created out of whole cloth by animators. The modern look of films is defined by actors on set wearing some combination of costume that's limiting or suggestive of the final look before artists go in afterwards and paint the rest of the costume on. Taking a physical performance and duplicating it with an amulated simulacrum, once the odd fixation of a few weirdos from Brooklyn, is now ordinary. In a weird way, Bakshi's Lord of the Rings is a 21st century blockbuster made with 1970s technology. And in the end, he would ultimately be vindicated. 
the argument that animation could be more mature, could be dramatic, could be adult, could be a perfect medium for a story like The Lord of the Rings was absolutely true, and Bakshi's work wouldn't be relegated to mere novelty status. Despite the waning attendance to his own films, his work in the 70s more or less set the tone for feature animation in the 80s, which was dominated by the dark, often somber films of Don Bluth. Because everything is connected, Rankin Bass worked with Peter Beagle and turned his book The Last Unicorn into a haunting and mature film in 1982. Even Disney, on the verge of bankruptcy, would try to play to the trend with their own adaptation of a mid-century fantasy epic with the notorious flop The Black Cauldron. Then, of course, The Simpsons would begin airing in 1989. In 1993, MTV began a late-night block of adult animation that ran the whole gamut from crass to cerebral, and over the course of the 80s and 90s, anime would go from being a niche import to a staple pillar of modern animation. So that's the story of Bakshi and the Ring. I think what I find compelling about his Lord of the Rings is a summary of what I find compelling about the man himself and his career as a whole. One that is deeply flawed but undeniably bold and occasionally brilliant. <laughs>